All right, so um, thank you all for joining us tonight for the second of our two-part series with Dr. Feza Rumsey on uh, inflammatory bowel disease surgery. And um, this uh, Dr. Rumsey is, is a surgeon who needs no introduction, um, currently at NYU Langone Health as the, uh, director, the director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center. Um, and I, uh, I understand that recently you have taken a position uh, in Long Island. And so congratulations. And uh, we look forward to seeing what else we have to offer to the world of colorectal surgery. Um, today, we are very pleased to hear from you about uh, the treatment and management of Crohn's disease and specifically on, um, on pouch surgery. So I'll hand the floor over to you, Dr. Ramsey, and thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you so much kindly for that uh, gracious uh, introduction. I have the privilege of talking to you guys last week and uh, happy holidays to everyone in the sense of whatever the holidays you celebrate. And may New Year bring unity, happiness, and prosperity to you and all your families. So I have nothing to disclose as a conflict of interest. So when we talk about the ulcerative colitis and the pouch surgery, uh, I got frozen one second. Ah, there it is. So when we look at the fact that the J pouch surgery, which is in my opinion, the ultimate goal and surgical treatment of ulcerative colitis, there is a good amount of negative data out there. And these are for right reasons. But when you look at the big series, that 97% of patients are happy with the results of their surgery and they would recommend the surgery others in their condition if they need to be. So when the patients come to me, I heard these horrific things in the literature or in the websites, the patient chat groups and everything I tell them. The data in these, uh, you know, the sites, they're correct, but it's skewed because the patients really who are suffering dramatically, they're on the website complaining about the things, but the patients are doing really well. They're out enjoying their life. And specifically, I think we also have a healthcare system issue with the IBD and a pouch surgery where the further subspecialization experience, double teeping with a senior surgeon, with a junior surgeon that really requires that mentoring to get the right numbers. So the learning curve is not being done solo right off the training is one of the big opportunities or the issues that we need to overcome in the next five to 10 years. But these are the results. This pouch surgery gives a good outcome to these patients. They're happy with their results. Are there any other surgical options when you treat ulcerative colitis? Yes. Such as subtotal colectomy and endoleostomy that most of in our practice, I do this as a first line of therapy that try to do a three-stage procedure. Sometimes in patients with the total abdominal colectomy, the iliorectal anastomosis. And in the past, this was done a lot because the patients did not have a hair pouch option. And in order to avoid a permanent ileostomy, patient was able to get rid of the bulk of the disease and they were able to treat the lower rectal disease with more direct therapy such as enemas and everything. This is like we're talking about before 90s and 80s era. So that was really a good option at that time. People started to use this thing, especially from the Scandinavian countries. It's an option for ulcerative colitis. But to be honest with you, in my opinion, if somebody has a good or normal, normal enough to be reconnected at this DNH, I do believe that is more of a Crohn's disease rather than ulcerative colitis. So if somebody has a true ulcerative colitis where the rectum is diseased, I would not be doing an iliorectal anastomosis on these patients. People try to push this out as an option for a patients to avoid fertility issues. I'm not buying it. If they have a really a severe rectum, their infertility will be messed up due to the activity of the disease. So I rarely do this unless patient has a Crohn's, which is a rectal sparing in definition type of picture. Not every patient candidate for a J-POUCH procedure, elderly uh, population, poor incontinence, or a low rectal cancer, these patients may need to get a permanent ileostomy. Now, the other option is a total proctor colectomy is a continent ileostomy. There are two options uh, we have. One of them is a Koch, Nielsen Koch, who has actually done this procedure initially for urinary system in patients in Egypt with, for the schistromyasiasis as a parasite that causes bladder cancer. Then we took this on and applied to the surgery colorectal surgery for the GI system, 
uh, where there's a nipple valve. Initially, it was done with a J pouch style as a reservoir, but now we currently do more of a S pouch down result. The other one is the Barnett pouch. Barnett got a lot of crack added with the academic surgeons, but I've seen patients with Barnett, it actually works. The overall, whether it's a Barnett or a cock, this is the thing with the patients. If the patients have one time of a constant ileostomy, it's tough for these patients to go back to a permanent end ileostomy. And again, this was the era before the J-Pouch procedure it became really popular. And right now, as a first-line therapy content ileostomy, I don't think it should be done unless patient has a reason that cannot have a pouch procedure done. Because I start to see this thing more and more coming some marketing purposes as a content ileostomy and trashing the J-Pouch procedure more on this side of the continent that I sincerely put a word of caution to that, that a good pouch procedure at any day is much better than a continent ileostomy, in my opinion. Now, if the J-Pouch fails and the patient has a severe aversion for a permanent ileostomy and a redo pouch can't be done, of course, they can be constant for a content ileostomy as long as we don't compromise the length of the bowel and everything in these settings. But let's talk about, in my opinion, the, the gold standard therapy, which is a J pouch procedure. Now, the initial aspect on these patients that I'm incredibly liberal for the right reasons, patients has a significant comorbidity, obesity, of biologics, agents, high dose prednisone, severe albuminia, severe anemia. In my hands, these patients do get uh, you know, the initial colectomy. And I'm very vulnerable because the last thing you want to do, the number one reason that I see these video pouches in our hands, when the patients were prematurely have done a two-stage procedure and then the leak abscess and everything happens. Let's get back to this immunobiologic age. I want to make sure that I'm not trashing to our gastroenterology colleagues, but they have a huge conflict of interest in these medications. And then they tried to put these things out that we did the studies that it doesn't impact the surgical outcome. It's very misleading. Most of these patients had an initial colectomy done. And if you don't do a pouch, it's just, I tell people, it's like keeping your car in the garage in New York City uh, and you don't get into accident. So if you don't do anastomosis, you're not going to leak. And we have done this in Cleveland when I was there in two studies with Isabella Moore and Jin Yu Yu. We found the fact that you know, the, it is okay to operate on the biologics, but stage them. When you do the two stage in these settings, these patients have a higher risk of the septic complications. So I do believe in the fact that if you try to do a two stage procedure in the setting of a high dose biologics, the patients will feel fail. And I do, I do not believe, and I do have a difference of opinion with people who try to say the fact that biologics don't increase perioperative infections when you do two stage. J pouch procedure, just stage them when it takes. And I don't know if it's a direct effect or not, but it's the indirect effect. That means the patients are coming to us too late. That's okay, but just stage them. So is the rest of the stuff. So when I stage them, I like to leave the rectal sigmoid stump close to the skin. So 20, 30% of the time, disruptions when the patients are skin, is sick. So I rather deal with a wound infection with a secondary mucus fistula. I don't primarily mature them rather than a, a, you know, the pelvic abscess infection that may impact the patient's fertility dramatically. So that's how I do. And it's very critical that you have the ileostomy here when you bring it, there is a, a room for a two flange because if this mucosa, excuse me, the stump ruptures becomes a mucous fistula, the drainage from there can come under and sometimes this may need to be pouched. So you gotta make sure measure it that they may need to put a secondary bag in the long run there's enough room when you mature the ileostomy and where the rectal sigmoid stump is. So this is the ultimate goal. I do believe it's a gold standard procedure. I was in UK one time, one of the surgeons said the fact that I don't believe in a J-pouch procedure. And I told them, like, then they should be doing it. You got to believe in the procedure, what you do. If you don't believe in the procedure, send somebody who believes in doing this procedure, which I do believe is a gold standard surgical therapy. What do we do with the J-pouch? I'm a believer, however you do, that I don't leave the meso. Either it's a total mesorectal excision if somebody has a preoperative dysplasia or cancer, or it's a near total excision, which means that I stay posterior to the vessels. Laterally, I may shave into the meso. Anteriorly, I stay um, posterior to the denon villier, fascia, but I take the meso out. We'll get in that later. I measure this proximal interphalangal joint, 
the way that how I measure that thing, and I do the uh, you know the staple, come across most of the time TA30. If you're using TA45 or 60, that means you have not gone low enough to the anorectal ring area, uh, then you're going to leave a long cuff and a meso. It's going to be an issue for the patient. So that's really, you need to be careful. You need to thin the rectum down to be able to handle the linear stapler. I do this procedure as a hybrid procedure. So the initially they got in my hands, uh, correct me. And the second stage, I do, I do a lower midline or a Fannington incision and making sure the fact that I come across this area with one stapler gun. People say laparoscopy and everything. Yeah, you can do the laparoscopically. If you can get a one stapler gun from this area, rather than the hat trick, Vietnamese, Chinese, and everything, you're asking for two or three stapler lines, that's equal to more leak. So if it means the fact that I make a lower midline incision or a panishing incision, I'm happy to do that to be able to come to this area uh, because I do not compromise coming across the lower anorectal junction more than one firing at least in my hands, is equal to TA31 firing rather than endo-GIA is one, two, three, four, sometimes is equal to leak. And this is the problem. There is not a one good instrument to come transabdominally to come across this area. And that's the reason Antonino Spinelli's technique from the bottom, the TKS, is required. And he showed the fact that he had uh, better outcomes uh, from the bottom technique than the top. But be aware, I uh, asked him, he's a dear friend of mine, did you compare this with the open technique or did you compare it with the laparoscopic linear GIA stapler? He said they were all laparoscopic linear stapler. And that just tells you the issue that the issue that I articulated about a more than one firing of an anorectal ring is an issue is equal to leak. And that's the way how he was able to overcome by coming from the below. And be my guess if you want to do that. But I just make a lower midline incision to come across with the TA30 because this is the Achilles tendon of the surgery. This is the part that needs to go right. The rest becomes very secondary. So I come across in that area, then I create the J pouch with a two or three firings of a GIA 100, and then come across with the TA30 with a linear stapler, making sure the fact that it's angulated, the meso is higher, tip of the J pouch. So we check for a leak. If there is no leak, and I bring the stapler posterior to the suture line and then pause the angle, making sure the fact that you do not grab the vagina, which is a disastrous complication, and don't kid yourself. You need to make sure you're one centimeter be, uh, uh, you know, the, off the vagina when the, uh, the stapler comes across. And as what I said, come posterior to the uh, suture line. And I do a lot of bimanual maneuver of the staple right hand in the stapler gun and the left hand in the pelvis, making sure I guide the trocar to come posterior to the suture line. And this is an example situation of the structure coming posteriorly. And then we bring the, uh, uh, you know, the J pouch. And then we make sure the fact that check for a leak, there is no leak. We give the elastomy a patient for three months. I like to bring the meso posteriorly because if you have to come back, it's much easier to take the meso off the sacrum rather than the serosa. And the anterior bringing the meso concerns bring me a twisty uh, type of a structure that can cause impact the, uh, you know, the outcome of the patient of structure defecation. So this is the way the anatomy after the pouch. I give a J pouch. You ask them for three months. I usually get the gastric gas and enema, but I started to add a MRI of the pelvis before I close the leostomy, I think it's much more sensitive to the gastrographic animal. If you have reach issues, you got to take the, I, I'm a believer of you got to take the leocolic high up at the first surgery. Then the meso elongates by time, so you have less reach issues. If you leave the iliocolic attached at the first surgery, it's not going to give a time to elongate by time. So I'm a believer to take the meso. By the way, if you're going to do an s pouch when there's a reach issue, you have to take the iliocolic anyway. So I take the iliocolic at the first surgery at the initial colectomy. Uh, this is the simulation of that thing, and you made the scoring. It's not like true and true that the simulation shows it misleading. You just score over the SMA and have the things to come down. And in order to make sure the things do reach, I put my finger the patient's anal canal to the Babcock and see the things do reach. Because the last thing that you do, which I do get probably one Every other two to three months, I'm in the OR, the things they reach. But to do in that setting, do not excise the pouch. But, you know, the, before you do the J pouch, create the J pouch, simulate. If the J pouch doesn't reach, an S pouch can give 
another two to three centimeter distance for the things to reach, but it usually need to be careful. It should not be more than two, three centimeters. Otherwise, the patient is going to have obstructive defecation for life. And some of the things that I try to tell my fellows, they need to go through this thing. What happens if the state from is back? Take a deep breath. Ask your own personnel. The fellows always tell there's a knee-jerk reaction. I will do a mucosectomy. No. Don't do a mucosectomy unless the patient has the indication for the mucosectomy. You can do a transabdominal abdominal single staple diastomosis, or you go down, put the single, single stapler, kind of a TTS, what this, uh, you know, Spinelli was talking about, and then, or you can do a hands-on anastomosis directly to the to the uh, area of the things misfired. This is a common board question that comes, so be prepared and keep these slides for your uh, things uh, files. And this is the way how you do the posterior. You're going to start posteriorly and the nut ends up anteriorly. You don't want to start anteriorly, finish posteriorly, otherwise it's going to be a nightmare to bring the purse string down to do so. But nothing works. The things don't reach. If you are smart enough that you judge the things, you don't make the J pouch, tenderly ask me, leave the staple on a rectal stump and come back in a year. If you did a mucosectomy and everything was fired, try to find a moment to bring it down through the anal canal with a separate film so it doesn't scar too much. Now, if you make the pouch the critical thing, do not, do not excise the pouch. Just leave the pouch there, staple the, you know, the orifice and leave it in the pelvis. So just like the, how the mesentery elongates by time I said in the iliocolic artery, that thing is going to happen in that sense too. And the other one is the continent ileostomy can be an option if the sphincter uh, is a mess and the things are not working and it can be an option that you can consider. Let's talk about some controversial topics. Is it okay to do the elderly, the J-pouch? Yes, but be aware, increase frequency and seepage and comparable quality of life. Sometimes people do studies to understand the fact that the things that they should not be doing it, don't do it in the setting of toxic colitis, stage the pouches. Don't make it an ego thing, patient, the one who gets to suffer at the end with years of morbidity. I see these again and again all over the country. And once again, my father was a surgeon and he always said, don't be critical of your colleagues' complications, the same thing can happen in the future to you. But this is the reason we have these lectures. Just have my head to pop out in your guy's mind and just stage the procedure. We remember the fact that I lose nothing by staging it and leave the rectum long. Don't cut the rectum at the presacral area and everything. It's going to do the proctectomy nightmare and everything with major injuries. Is it okay to do any cancer? Yes. Be aware as long as you do a proper cancer operation. Comparable oncologic outcome, comparable functional outcome, increased pouch failure because these patients do get chemo, they're older and everything, so they have a high risk of pouch failure. One thing that we cannot do is giving a radiation after a pouch procedure. There are four or five reported cases, all of those pouches failed in the long run, so that's something you guys need to be aware of. You cannot radiate the pouch post-operative. I mean, these guys are my friends. I'm not trying to pick on them. They said it's the surgeon's decision to do a staple hands-on anastomosis. There are indications for a hands-on anastomosis that I'm going to share. But if you can do a stapled anastomosis and you don't have an indication to do a hands-on anastomosis, I do believe staple gives a better functional outcome than the hands-on anastomosis, okay? Now, the other thing, uh, you know, the... The other thing is that, you know, I think we need to know the fact that here's the number of the stapler versus mucosectomy, that the patients who has uh, a stapler, they have a better functional outcome, less septic complications than the mucosectomy group. This is a pretty strong number. People try to get a crank at to my mentor. Maybe you guys have not done enough mucosectomy type of a uh, smart uh, ALEC type of response, but we have done enough mucosectomy that uh, we can compete with anybody how it needs to be done in a humble fashion. Now, people also argue that when you leave the mucosa behind, you may have a higher issue of the inner canal inflammation. How true is that? Very little, not that high. But the concept of leaving the cuff should not be more than one and a half to two centimeter maximum because this MIS and everything, uh, you know, the both really the issue what the Nick Fazio and the Professor Nichols lived decades ago. At that time, they were both right, they were both wrong. Because Nichols was saying the fact that you need to do mucosectomy, when you do a staple, you're leaving a long rectal path. You know what I mean? Uh, that he was right. And that's the reason he didn't want to have this thing to issue be happening. 
uh, with a leftover rectum. And the Vic was saying, if you mobilize good enough, you can only leave one and a half centimeter. You don't need to do mucosectomy. We are living this area again in the era of MIS and the robotic, where the people are not adequately and properly mobilizing the rectum to come across as the way how I showed. They are leaving a long rectum, a long cuff, which is a big deal issue, an indication of a redo pouch surgery. We are converting the problem of uh, ulcerative colitis to continue therapy, ulcerative proctitis, and then washing our hands and putting on the gastroenterologist's hands like the patient has a Crohn's, which is, I believe is wrong. We need to educate ourselves. It's just a proximal enteral flowing, and it's one and a half to two centimeter of an anal transit zone. That's pretty much the maximum. So here's the things that I like to do, the indication for me when I do a staple or a hands on anastomosis. No dysplasia in the colon and rectum. They all get stapled anastomosis as long as they don't have the TSC. If they have a dysplasia cancer in the rectum, it depends on where it is. If it's a dysplasia confined to colon or the upper rectum or cancer of the colon, I still do staple and follow up yearly. But if someone has a dysplasia cancer in the lower two thirds of a rectum, I really prefer to do a mucosectomy and hands on anastomosis, especially in the setting of a rectal cancer. Now, this other thing that become that we're inventing the history of drives me nuts that this modified two-stage IPAA procedure with fewer septic complications and everything, I'm not believing in it because this is going to be something that's going to come up in the long run. They haven't followed up these patients well in the long run. They're coming from the bottom, or oh, let's just do a no ileostomy, modified two-stage procedure. Can it be done? It can be done. Should it be done? That's the issue because septic complications create a problem. The colleagues from the Dutch and the Belgium and some of the U.S. people they are on this bandwagon saying the fact that, oh, you know, when you do this, you have less leak, you're leaving the meso behind and everything. They have not followed those patients up in the long run to see what type of a problem they're going to associate. Because we have a history that the pediatric surgeons used to do that. We're going to get in there in a second. Now, can you avoid the leostomy? Yes. This is my rule. We published this many years ago. Humble, an experienced surgeon who's going to have 50 or more experience in his or her hands. Electric procedure, motivated patient. No dose prednisone, that's the era of the Chandra. No blade of Chandra, God bless his heart, he passed away. No immunomodulating edges biologics and unmental operation. And these ones, I do it, but it's a longer recovery. Patients, when they get a leak, they, they, their function is still okay, and rarely they require an ileostomy. So the judgment and the selection is very, very important when to do that. I have done three or four in the last five, six, six seven years, they were either, maybe five, they were either FAP or a pay indication was a dysplasia, otherwise on a stable patient. So I'm very liberal about the concept of a three-stage procedure. The other reason is these patients, if you're not going to give an ileostomy, they need to be local. They cannot be going to Vegas and everything. One time I had a patient life flighted uh, all the way from Vegas when I was Cleveland. So that was a wake-up call for me. And one person, they went back in there, they excised the pouch of the one-stage procedure when she had an ileus. So you got to be careful and make the common sense, wisdom, judgment, whom you're going to do. Now, if you have a center in Europe that you do this every day and you have the infrastructure to do it, be my guest. But you cannot make this as a guideline for the whole world saying the fact that it's okay to do an J pouch procedure without any ileostomy. I'm in completely disagreement with that. I want to make sure this is heard loud and clear by everybody. Now, can you do it in the setting of a Crohn's disease? Yes. And here are the reasons. We have done this. Melton Mew, she's a I think, professor at the University of Minnesota right now. She was one of my fellows when we were in Cleveland. Uh, 204 patients. Now, if you have a diagnosis of the Crohn's, which means the initial colectomy, that those patients did well. Patient who got a two-stage procedure colectomy came back as Crohn's, they did do well. The patients who not, do not do well, they declare themselves as a Crohn's disease in the long run, which there is nothing we can do. And that's the number that I say, two to seven percent of the patients may develop Crohn's disease in the long run. So for those reasons, with a proper consenting and everything, with a no small bowel disease and a limited questionable perianal disease, like a one, uh, you know, the cryptogranular fistula, I may do. I may consider doing a J pouch procedure in that setting. I like to take the anorectal up, and I like to take the mucosa out. And I like. I'm very liberal putting these patients on biologics if the patient. But this needs to be patient driven, not surgeon driven. Type of delivery: 
Vaginal delivery, people are safe. I don't agree too much. This is the study we have done this many years ago. When you do a, this is a blinded uh, ultrasound ultrasonographer, C-section has a much less sphincter defect than the vaginal delivery, including also the squeeze pressures, much, much better in the C-section group. It did not reflect on the quality of life, except the time trade-off still showed the benefit on the C-section, but it did not reflect on the functional results so far. But this is something I don't want to tell my patients 20, 30 years down the line, but I was wrong, sorry, that you had a vaginal delivery, so I'm very liberal on the C-section. The other thing in the era, this you know, the controversy came in US at least, they used to do median episiotomy, which was crazy. Thanks God, the fact that I heard that has stopped. But Europe and Canada, they always did a medial lateral episiotomy. Right now, I understand that the episiotomy has stopped, which is a wonderful thing to hear. But still, as long as there's a very strong contraindication not to do a C-section, I do believe uh, in these patients that a C-section is safer, despite understanding C-section can be a problem. But when, if you're going to do a C-section, you cannot have the labor start. If you get the patient preterm, the impact of the hormones of the sphincter starts there. So you need to do elective C-section. MS and IPAA, just stick to the same principles. You can do the procedure CrossFit upside down. You can do it robot, single report, laparoscopies, single thing, whatever, trans just do the same principle. But I'm not a believer of a transanal TME going from the bottom, stretching the anal canal like a Lord injury for hours, saying the fact that these patients are going to have the same outcome. If you do a limited stuff like the spinellus technique, it's single staple from the bottom. I have no problem with that, but you cannot stretch the sphincters for hours because it impacts their functional outcome in the long run, like the initial transanal TMEs were described for pouch procedures. Again, laparoscopy benefits the patients uh, as long as it's done the way that it should be done as the way how it described. This is a courtesy of Van Geyser from many years ago. Uh, we published this thing in a patient. It can be done on a single stage with excellent results. You can stick to the same principle. Now, let's get into the redo pouch section the last 15 minutes or so. I say this every time. Technology and innovation are fun as long as they are used with no compromise, but needs to be done surgically when we are serving our patients. You cannot, you cannot be doing a shortcut <clears throat> just to avoid a smaller incision, which by the way, benefits the patient can be done. So because of this thing, because of these technologies, and I'm blaming us on this thing, and I'm blaming sometimes the societies and everything, we did not do the proper message and strategies how this needs to be uh, guided. Right now, you guys are all brilliant surgeons, and please do not take this personal, that the society's board of surgeries allowance of five um, uh, is is okay to do a J pouch procedure. I don't agree with that. I articulated several times. Uh, I did three years of subspecialization uh, with my mentor. Maybe I wasn't good enough. Uh, I had a visa issue and everything. So it was a privilege and honor working that three years learning the technique. And I have done significantly, probably around 70 to 100 a year. And I tell my colleagues with humility and modesty, you have to do 50 or more before you can do these uh, pouches alone. So that, that's the reason. This is all about the patient. We need to be centralizing, and I think we may need to have an extra IBD subspecialization here on top of the colorectal or a cancer. That might be an option on certain centers. Now, this is the thing. These patients do suffer. This is a patient of mine, a nine-year-old kid that actually uh, I was able to convince the mother just allow me to explore her because every time they close her ileostomy, she got obstructed and she got labeled as a pelvic floor or crazy and everything. She had a 360 twisted pouch. It can happen to anybody. Actually, there's a funny story that she asked me to come to the operating room wearing pink. Uh, I look like a big piglet and I changed it in between, but she is doing great right now. She is going to college right now and no ileostomy. And this child was told to live with a permanent ileostomy. And I'm not trashing the MIS robot or anything. I beg you guys to hear me. It can be done the right way, the principles, be my guest, but because done MIS doesn't mean the fact that somebody needs to get a knife and open the patient's abdomen to see what's going, because sometimes you just cannot see the things laparoscopy. Sometimes you may see the things better laparoscopically, but in these cases, I think it's more the judgment call as a problem. There's another lady, this patient was a New Jersey 
Mrs. New Jersey, beauty pageant, one stage pouch, 15, six year dilatation of 15 years. Mucosectomy in oily aspirin. That was a common thing in New York area for so many years that, you know, we don't give any liastin. Well, guess what? These patients started to come out of the caves for a long period of time. Stricture, mucosectomy, uh, uh, anal vaginal fistula, diagnosed Crohn's disease is a common thing. We, I had to beg her for an ileostomy first. You can see this obstructed bowel here. We got the ileostomy. She's doing absolutely great right now with no stoma and everything with the three-stage redo procedure, excising the stricture and everything. My uh, directness of what I'm saying should not be interpreted as arrogance. I plead to you hear me, the amount of suffering these patients go through in their lives is very, very humbling. It's not only the patient suffers, it's the family suffers. There's a significant amount of increased divorce on these patients, the blame game, where did we go, why did we do that? So we, I am really passionate about this procedure, whoever does it, needs to pay the dues to be able to touch these patients. And we need to really regroup serving our patients with a subspecialization. Now, these are the things that people leave. They put the J pouch in the body, uh, sometime from the anastomosis, and this is a presacral area where the patients live. And again, when they leak patients, what happens, listen to the patient. If you listen to the patient, they will tell you the story of what happened. You don't have to look at the, any chart. You know, the, and you know, what happens in these circumstances uh, the if the things do happen within immediately after the surgery, within six months, usually mechanical technique. If it happens more than six months or a year later, it's like Crohn's. But sometimes the patients may have both, and they need to understand that. And uh, once again, as what I said, if I have a concern or suspicion of a Crohn's, which I cannot prove, I speak to our gastroenterologist colleagues and plead to them, can we put this patient on some biologic prophylactically? Well, it didn't work before. I tried to tell the patient. Trying to treat a disease that's different than the prevention. It, it restages the clock for prevention rather than the treatment. That's the reason it's very, very important to articulate the patient. The indication has changed. Now, this is the other thing, Ramsey principle that the fellows and the residents know. It's one can live happily after but a good quality of life with a stoma. Trying to convince them for a redo pouch surgery is a great disservice. This is not a surgeon agenda, come to me, I'll do a redo pouch. But more in the Europe, and I go there, I, I don't want to insult my British colleagues and everything, NHS, the socialized system, I do believe they don't want to push it. And when I asked them, we had a wonderful Danish visitor here, that I asked, well, do you guys, don't you guys have any pouches failed? With a very, very wonderful, slow Scandinavian accent, she told me, Dr. Ramsey, we have a lot of patients that walks around with an ileostomy. So the system probably don't want to do it uh, in that. But the patients in the U.S. system, by the way, I'm not saying U.S. system is better. We have bad parts here up to go bazoo. But there is pros and cons of any of the system. But if one cannot live happily after, don't tell the patient, just live with a stoma, judge them. Send somebody, doesn't have to be me, that who can do these things with a good service to the patient. Otherwise, it will be a disservice to these patients that they can't get suicidal. They will not enjoy their life for the rest of their life. Now, here's a problem. This is the uh, Dr. Essan started this article, uh, followed by Dr. Gilmes in our institution, 250 to redo vouchers. So the person of the patients were labeled as a Crohn's disease of the pouch. Uh, this was also initially done by Kelly Garrett, who's a faculty in Cornell. Initially, same numbers, nothing has changed. So this is something we need to be very self-critique as the surgeons. We need to check in our own footstep rather than after the leak infection heals, label the patient as a Crohn's disease and put it on gastroenterologist's lap and tell them like the Crohn's disease, treat them. They will not respond. And the patients lose the trust to the healthcare professionals and to the system. That's one of the common reasons in the patients with the IBD, why they don't like the healthcare professionals because of these complications again, again, and we need to come and work as a bridge collectively with a multidisciplinary approach in these for these patients. General principles, we evaluate the technical field. Check uh, your, I might check my own footsteps or our the surgeon's footsteps. That was a common line by, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, Barney Kyles and George Kyles' grandson-in-law, Caldwell Assistant, phenomenal pirate surgeon, but a great surgeon. He said, let's check your own footsteps, which means listen to the patients. 
the patient have a perioperative septic complication? I asked the patients, did you have a CT guided drainage? Did they take you back for a washout? Did you have any problems? When did the symptoms start? Did it start right after the surgery? Did it happen after a two or three years of great lifetime? If they tell me, hey, doc, this started to happen right after the surgery. They put a CT guided drainage. They waited for me six months to a nine months to a year before that happens. Then this is most likely a technical problem rather than labeling as a, a Crohn's disease. When these patients refer to us, commonly we get gastrograph and enema, pelvic MRI, exam under anesthesia and flexible pouchoscopy. Sometimes I may complement that with an anal manometry. A strategy for a redo IPAA. If not diverted, divert these patients for six months before considering a redo pouch, okay? So this is very important. You need to build the patient mentally, psychologically, and physically. So we do this portal ileostomy uh, at the first stage. The art of colorectal surgery to be prepared a couple steps ahead. And this is what exactly the total ileostomy is. You need to see the things a couple steps ahead. So we bring an ileostomy 20 centimeters or so upstream to the pouch. That's place the creation of a new pouch is needed in future. What does that mean? So 50% of the time, uh, Dr. Evan Essenar, uh, who's a resident with us at the NYU, wrote this up, and it was the first article published about this topic by comparing using the old pouch or the newly created pouch, found the fact that there was not too much differences. So that was again published in Surgery Journal, and that was the first article on this topic. What exactly it says here, here, as you can see, this pouch that was can be excised 50% of the time. If you excise it, you go to the ileostomy and put the stapler across, and you can bring the ileostomy down as a new pouch. But if you do the ileostomy here, or here, then you got to go all the way higher up. So that's the reason it's very important to have the things done totally ileostomy. And this is the reason I simply plead to you guys, if you're going to do a J-pouch procedure, don't do stapled side-to-side -side anastomosis. It really impacts our ability to redo pouch procedure. Just do a good old hands-on ileostomy closure so you can have the option of a redo pouch or less cumbersome in the long run. I think that's very important. No, this paper was written, uh, uh, you know, the uh, our uh, fellow uh, and a clinical associate, Schwarzberg, when he was with me uh, several years ago. A strategy for a redo IPAA, be prepared for the unexpected. Consent for a potential permanent ileostomy for the k pouch, ureter extents, uh, have the blood availability. If the patient has a septic complication, try to do this without excising that chronic pelvic segment is not going to work. So you need to push the limit. You need to be bold, as what I said. You need to be smart, uh, not uh, uh, brave, because if, I mean, people say courageous, but stupidity can bring courageous. You need to be bold. So you need to complement your knowledge, training, being bold by pushing the limit with the patient, not being ignorant. And go from known to unknown. Go sometimes cowardly, come up, and then you always need to have an exit strategy. Come back, retreat, and send to somebody else. And anybody who's going to do a J pouch, they need to have the skill set to be able to do a mucosectomy, hands-on anastomos, S pouch, or even a K pouch in this setting. Maybe this is a little bit pushing the limit. But if you're going to do a J pouch, uh, you got to be able to do the mucosectomy, hands-on, and an S pouch in these settings. And when these patients come, you like to get a proper MRI. We publish the stick with the MRI template, which is very important. This is the normal rectal cuff can be seen short. Now, this is a patient with a huge, that's anastomosis, really long. This is the anorectal ring. The whole cuff was left and the rectal. This is a pouch rectal anastomosis and a stool, the pouch body with a stasis at the back. They didn't serve this patient. I mean, so what? They did it with a small incision. And that's really the issue in these settings. And we got to teach our gastroenterologists when they do a, you know, endoscopy, they really need to do a proper digital exam. This is a, on a female patient, eight and a half centimeter of rectum left behind is really not productive. This is again, the whole meso on the rectum left behind in a patient. And this rabbit ear happened after that. You know, they also did a small pouch because obstructive defecation had this, you know, tip of the J pouch become like a floppy. Uh, you know, the, the rabbit ear in the long run that we had to incorporate it into the pouch to have the things work. Uh, the other thing is, when they leave the remnant rectum, uh, check the footsteps. This patient, rectum left, meso left. 
you know, the, and then this patient had a major pouch failure. So we were able to salvage the pouch, and, you know, remove the rectum and handle the problem. Now, this is something Hande, that Dr. Eidenler wrote it many years ago. Number one reason for these things to be more often comparing the open technique, the MIS techniques. Failed MIS was much higher in these settings because people didn't go as low as they should be as the way how I said, not blaming the technique. Not, but I cannot uh, label say it's just a learning curve. That learning curve needs to be happening under the umbrella or the mentorship of another surgeon. And we need to be double scrubbing these patients a lot. And this is a couple of the things I tell our radiologists, does the patient have a meso? The pediatric surgeons in the past, pediatric surgery, excuse me, when the pouch was done, when the kids, at the kid's age, the pediatric surgeons like to do uh, this uh, intra a meso dissection anterior to the spherical artery, which creates a major problem. By the time they get old, they don't see these patients, they become adult. So that's the reason they don't see that complication. But I don't want to be negative about our pediatric surgery colleagues. They're brilliant. And the credit goes to Lester Martin from University of Cincinnati. He was a gentle giant. So I had the privilege of having a dinner one time with him, who actually did this procedures much earlier than most of the people. But I think we need to take the meso out. And here is the reason. Now, if you do the total meso or near meso excision, that the pouch comes in that. So the people who are a proponent of an intermesoric dissection, so you leave a cavity for a blood seroma hematoma and do a proper, uh, you know, the, the surgery that you bleed less. I mean, it can happen, you know, in that sense. But if you do this, that you take the, you take the intramesenteric dissection. What happens is year two, five, ten is okay. The pouch then starts to work against obstructive defecation, and then it starts to find a way to drain itself out as a fistula. And Dr. Gilman's paper got accepted in this year's ASCRS. This patient's results, majority of them comes back with a long-term septic complications and fistulization. I'm saying this specifically that there's a big trend of this intra-mesenteric dissection right now with the transanal TME. I really do think we're going to see this problems a lot. This is a good old R technique. You come across, do your noise anastomosis, you're done with it, and you're happily after most of the time. Granted, you may have some issues <laughs> with the hematoma and everything. Again, try to be, uh, you know, just try to be more meticulous then. But I, I do believe that cavity businesses, I'm not buying it. Now, this is the other technique. That when you leave the meso behind and you take the rectum out, and then you bring the small bowel, shove it on through the meso, like the way our pediatric surgery colleagues try to do, or the new, uh, you know, the European, like the transanal group trying to promote this thing, leave the meso behind. I don't agree with that. But plus, that's the thing. That squeeze, squeeze a lot. And the patient's pouch needs to find a place, bam, finds it out as a fistula, and the patient gets labeled as a Crohn's disease, where most of the time the issue is the meso that has been left behind. Plus, I mean, you cannot have it both ways. People say the fact that take the meso out, it's a Crohn's, and let's take the meso out then, so we don't leave any source of potential Crohn's type of behavior in the long run. But this is some of those things. This is a patient, actually, she's a CrossFit uh, patient, that unbelievable talent and everything. All this meso was left behind and everything, and we had to excise this out. I mean, I mean, this is really real. It's not like a made-up story. We have 90%, 70, 70, 70 or 90% of these things that is going on right now. This is a real deal and an issue that's going to catch up with us in the long run. Another patient, intermesorectal dissection, that had to be dissected again and again to take the things out, and we were able to use that. But the whole meso left behind anterior dissection to the superior rectal artery. As can be seen here, we're taking that meso out, and then subsequent to that, we are able to, you know, to use the pouch to do the dissection. So this whole meso had to come out to do so. Again, a believer of a sharp dissection, you know, use the God-given tissue planes rather than creating your own anatomy. Tip of the J pouch lead can happen. It's frustrating. We start to use more regular ICGs. Uh, these things don't heal. You really need to restaple it. This is, by the way, everybody says that this patient was referred to us. I do have complications. This is my patient that we had to stick up the J pouch, either overslow it, staple it. Automatically, 
So when the anosmotic leaks happens, I tell the patient that closure of that ileostomy in three months is off the table. We drain them, and then every six to eight weeks, we do this EUA, downsize the drain. But I tell the patients it may take nine months to a year before somebody can close the ileostomy in that sense where the cavity goes away. Uh, if the rib stays, I may do like an unroofing bed ridge and have the cavity to be part of the pouch sometimes with the ligature. It's like a, a surgeon's uh, needle knife therapy uh, in that. Now, my frustration with that, there's an endo sponge that in Europe they use, unfortunately, when the people come and ask the usual like advisory board on the uh, payroll of the most of the companies, people said they don't have leaks and the company pulled the, that stuff out of the market, which is really tragic because it's actually a very good product, but we created our own system. We used on two, three patients with good results. It cuts down to 69 months to early phase. Now, the other things, if you're gonna do a conservative approach, honestly, a leak takes nine months to a year. Don't close these patients before nine months or so because it reactivates. I had a patient recently sent to us from Pennsylvania who had this approach Then six months they closed the ileostomy, it came back again. So please hear me. When you have a leak, accept, tell the patient, three months off the table, nine months to a year before I would close it, uh, the ileostomy. And this technique usually works 85% of the time, 15% of the time it might not work. You may have to do the, the procedure. So this uh, patient, the simulation of that, the leak, if the leak this happens, these are the things that you're going to get in there. Just connect the pouch from the anus. And then you're going to excise that cavity. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that, that's going to help out the things to be able to clean out. And you can use 50% of the old pouch. 50%, you may have to make a new pouch in this setting. This is a patient from, Stan uh, from uh, you know, the uh, uh, West Coast. One of my fellows in Stanford was kind enough to send her to me because the cricket was lost in the West Coast, uh, you know, the, the system, syndicate. God bless her heart. She's a phenomenal surgeon. She said, you know, the, let me send you to my mentor. So and the kid was labeled as a bipolar. The kid didn't have a bipolar. She just had a pouch surgery, went wrong. She actually became pregnant and had a beautiful baby right now. It's one of the most gracious letters that I received, both from her and the mother, in that sense, that she's doing great. Now, the other things, MIS can open open. And this is the part. Remember, I tell you the part, anytime that you really are not humble, bam, that the devil gets you, like how uh, you know Denzel Washington told to Will Smith that your highest time, that the devil is going to get you, this happens a lot. You did the resection, you did the J pouch, you didn't check the orientation, more common on laparoscopically, and then the patient pouch has been twisted as the way how it can be seen here. Don't waste your time, you have to redo this thing, uh, disconnect it and mature it properly. Sometimes everything can go wrong. This can be seen long mess of twist and everything in that sense. So, uh, you know, when we look at this initial article, we said that the overall five to 10 years, 85% success rates. We looked at numbers here the last seven years that I had the privilege working at the NYU. Over 500 patients, primary 252, redo 50, 253. And this is really a sad story because we should be doing more primary and redo, but it's really... The, the nature of the practice which we are humbled to serve. Uh, the results are pretty good out of these 500 patients. For the primary, 6.9% leak rate, close to 20% the redo. But again, you gotta take care of these patients, but at the and look at it in the primary success group, 92% success rates, and the redo group, our success rates are around 82 to 85% rate because we're pushing the limit. We may down a little bit down, but Again, still uh, very good results can be seen here. Now, the reach issue, people say about can the things reach and everything. So this is Dr. Wong, who works at Red Israel right now as a faculty. Wonderful to have him as a fellow last year, a brilliant surgeon, a brilliant academician. 461 ileal pouch surgery in seven years, 49 hospital revisional. Overall, in our practice, 1.5% intraoperative abandonment. For a primary, one patient, one or four. 2.6% on the revisional, reason for abandonment, inadequate reach, two related to high BMI. So I don't do J pouches, anybody above 30. 
they need to do their due diligence by getting a proper weight loss regime or a bariatric surgery. FAP was the number one reason not to do the surgery with also concern for a shortcut with the prior resections and again, again, in the setting of the FAP. s pouch is very critical. If the s pouch doesn't work in the redo setting, uh, uh, you know, lowercase h pouch can work. This was Dr. Aydin's paper that can be seen here. This is how to do a s pouch. Up one layer at the back, you come anteriorly, uh, to, to 12 to 15 centimeter of each limb, and then you join the dots, and then you put a second layer uh, on the posterior wall, and then you bring the things back together. Again, the exit conduit needs to be two centimeter. Beyond that, it's going to be a problem for these patients. So this is a result that we submitted uh, to the uh, ASA. Uh, we'll see that the results are pretty similar. When you do these enough, I think you can bring your complication rate and the success rates as close as to your primary pouches. Our aim, again, as surgeons, that for these patients, they suffer a lot. These are the four A's that I learned from my parents and from my mentor. Availability, affability, ability, and accountability. Thank you so much again. I'm sorry I had to uh, rush a little bit, but I want to make sure I got to give as much as message available. And if you guys have any questions, I'm delighted to take. And thank you so much again for your hospitality, inviting me two weekends in a row. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramsey. And uh, again, a very comprehensive review. And I think we're all going to have to go back and review the recording to take down all the pearls and wisdom that you've um, shown us today. So we do have a few questions that I'll moderate. Um, the first is uh, from Dr. S Dr. Specht. Uh, do you use gastrographin or any kind of um, uh, imaging prior to ileostomy reversal to check yes. your pouch? Yes, I do gastrographin enema uh, routinely. I started to add more of an MRI of the pelvis in the past. So when I first uh, came, that the only thing I used to check was a gastrographin enema for a primary and a redo. The redos, the MRI was much better. So we added uh, MRI of the pelvis plus the gastrographin in the redos, but now even the primaries that I started to add on an MRI of the pelvis, especially if the patient had a rough postoperative course, making sure the fact that I did not miss any occult leak during the perioperative period that might have happened where MRI gives a better result, ma'am. Uh, and you've mentioned fertility issues several times in this talk, and we'd love your thoughts on how do you counsel younger patients um, about fertility preoperatively when they're so, considering a pouch, and do you routinely refer them to fertility counseling? Yeah, so for a redo pouch, I do recommend them to harvest the egg. For a primary pouch, I don't, okay? But by the way, that also goes for the men too. For a primary pouch, I don't have them to bank the sperm. For a redo pouch, I tell them to bank the sperm. You never know. Uh, despite how good you are, you may be in the pelvis, you may in the setting of a concrete atmosphere. Now, the infertility uh, uh, for a man, I tell them there's a 1% to 4% chance of a sexual dysfunction as a retrograde ejaculation or a, a, a erectile dysfunction. For female, I mean, this data came from the Danish in the sense of the FAP setting. When you get in the pelvis, that it increases the infertility. But that was the FAP. Then we used the UC, and uh, you know, the one of uh, my fellows uh, who's in Cleveland right now, he was a research associate. We looked at this Gergen. Uh, you know, there was a good amount of patients when they are sick preoperatively, they also have a tough time getting pregnant. Now, granted, pouch surgery impacts. Uh, the more getting difficult to pregnant, but that doesn't, they cannot get pregnant. And consider the fact that the infertility rate in the US is around 15 to 20, 17%. We're a little bit off. So I really proceed as the way it is, but I tell them this is what the data is. If you want 100% sure, the fact that you don't want to have any issue, then have your deliveries done between your initial colectomy to the J pouch procedure. You know, the, but I also tell them most of the time it is really not an issue. And that is the reason I like to stage these procedures because I think the septic complication is the number one thing. And the laparoscopy, one of the papers showed the fact that a better fertility rate, I think avoiding the scar in the pelvis is important. 
The other thing that I do in female setting in a, who wants to get pregnant, I wrap the ovaries with separate film. Oh, okay. What else? Um, couple of questions from Sir John. Um, what if a patient had pelvic radiation before pouch formation? Um, yeah. Do you, what considerations do you have for those patients? Yeah, so I do the J pouch on those settings. Uh, you know, the, because and, and that's the other, it's a great question, by the way. If somebody, uh, you know, if you have a rectal cancer, I, I, I like to over treat these patients with radiation pre-operated and post-op uh, because it kills the radiation. But some patients get a prostate radiation or cervical cancer. Uh, you know, I tell the patient they their function may be a little bit worse comparing to a patient with non-radiated. But that will not stop me doing a J-pouch in these settings unless there is some major contraindication such as fistulization or anything like that. I warn them, uh, but I go ahead and do the J-pouch in these settings if they had radiation for different reasons. And you had also mentioned that um, if there is reach issues, you can leave the pouch in the pelvis. Uh, in those situations, do you close the pouch opening or just put a drain and leave the common enterotomy open? No, you close that. You don't want to have the mucus and pus draining their bus in that area. But I did that only once. Most of the time, it's very critical remembering me, have my heads pop out, not to do the J-pouch. You know, if you want to leave, leave the staple alone. It didn't reach. Or don't do the protectomy. If you feel like it's not going to work, just close the patient. I'm so proud of somebody from Atlanta many years ago. The guy was a prominent principal there. He said, this is not going to reach. And he just closed the patient and sent it out. And we had to lose weight and everything, we were able to do it. So the critical thing is not to do the J pouch uh, or not excising it. Okay, if you do the J pouch, just leave it as the way how I said. It's a loopleostomy in the pelvis. Put some separate film in that area. And by the way, I have no conflict in interest with the company. Uh, uh, and then do a loopleostomy uh, and, and come back. I used to use a lot separate, but I don't use it that much anymore, just to let you know. You know the right. And uh, there are a couple questions uh, about pouch in FAP. So the yeah. first is, what are your thoughts on pouch in patients with FAP without desmoids, but they have a higher risk mutation, such as a codon 14, uh, greater than 1400? Yeah, although those patients, I like to do a J pouch from the get-go. That because the argument over there, I, I uh, are, you know, we had a meeting in ESCP and I was there with Matt Kaledi. Uh, so the argument is, if you can do an IRA, you do an IRA, you know? Uh, and the criteria is that uh, church many years ago published 20, a little bit up and down, 20 or less than you do an IRA in those settings, okay? But if somebody's a high risk in these settings uh, and a high, uh, you know, the uh, risk for a, a polyposis, uh, it's better off to the pouch from the get-go uh, rather than trying to come back in those settings, uh, in that. Now, people say you may want to do an IRA and leave the rectum. Uh, I, I don't like that. If you can do the J pouch from the get go and the, the uh, you know, the count in the rectum uh, is uh, too high, uh, then I will do a J pouch. If it's not, then I will do an IRA. And a similar question is if uh, there's dysplasia in patients with FAP, do you do a mucosectomy for those patients? When you do but, the J. Here's the thing uh, uh, my, my, I want to tell my colleague. The dysplasia is a kind of a uh, misconception because they it's such, it's a polyp. You know what I mean? It's a polyp we're talking about. So if some, this is my criteria for a mucosectomy of a, you know, the in FAP. Rectal cancer, you know, the, because it's different than the, uh, you know, the ulcerative colitis. If, if I have a margin, uh, uh, you know, carpeted polyps, in the ATZ or a polyp greater than one centimeter or so in the rectum, these are the patients that I like to do a mucosectomy uh, in these settings. Those are the patients so, I present them for a potential endoliostomy. So if you're going to do a mucosectomy in these FAP patients, from the data that I shared, they have a higher chance of reach issues. So they need to understand the potential chance that things may not reach. And they may end up with a permanent ileostomy. Small chance. That looks like all our questions for tonight. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Dr. Rumsey. This was this was great. Thank you very much for joining us twice. <laughs> and I hope you have a happy holiday. You too, all of you guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate Take your care. time. Thank you again. Bye-bye.